Actually, we're going to study convolution integral and unit in step response. Unit in pulse response, excuse me. The objective here is to, is to find a way to represent signals based on primitive functions, which are in this case the impulse uh, function. And you're going to see that uh, because of certain properties of the system, if you know the system's response to a unit impulse, we can describe the system response to any other type of input. So all we need to know when you want to calculate or determine this output, the system, this response, is to know one specific characteristic of that system. That is, its response to a unit impulse. And provided then that the system is linear and time invariant, that is, it respects the conditions we established in the last lecture, then we can use that primitive function to describe the behavior of the system for any other type of input. Okay. Somebody has the uh, microphone on, please mute, uh, mute it if you, I will change the settings to automatically mute uh, everybody in the next one. And uh, if you have questions, then turn it on, please. Okay, so that's the idea today. So this lecture is a bit complicated. Uh, let's see how it goes. My plan, original plan, is just to use this lecture to go over convolution integral and then move on next week. Let's see how far we get, depending on how many questions you have, how you uh, perceive the subject. And if you need an extra lecture on Monday, then you're going to continue this on Monday, maybe do some more examples. Let's see at the end of the lecture how it goes, and we can assess that. So by the end of this lecture, the objective is to understand the concept of impulse response, why impulse response is important, observe the relation between the impulse response and the convolution integral. In other words, how we can use an impulse response to determine the response of the system to other impulses or other inputs and calculate this famous convolution integral. So let's jump uh, right into it from the last lecture we establish certain conditions that are, are the systems you're going to study have to meet. The first one was that the system is linear, and the second one was that the system is time invariant. So here is a reminder of that. If the system is time invariant, that means that the characteristics of that system do not change over time. And that entails that if we apply a input to the system at time zero, and you see a certain response, and we apply the same input to the system at uh, 10, 10 seconds later, we shall see the same response again, exactly the same shape, but a shifted in time. This is what this slide is showing here, and that's what the equations represent. If at time t we get a output, if apply the input x of t, we get an output y of t. If we delay that input by a certain amount of time, we should see the exact same response, but a shifted in time. And that can only be observed provided that the system is linear and provided that the system is time invariant. All the characteristics of the system do not change between the time uh, in the first excitation and the second excitation, yeah? which is hardly true in many systems. As uh, we discussed in the last lecture, a plane, when it takes off, has a certain mass. And when it lands, it has a different mass because it was burning fuel. So its response to an acceleration input may not be the same because the mass is going to be decreasing over time. So that is clearly not a time invariant system. Is a, uh, one parameter of the system is changing over time. So what do we do with that? Th does that mean that all our analyses are pointless? No, we can assume that for a short period of time, within a minute or two, the mass of the plane is constant, and then we analyze the system around that specific point in time. Okay. Another interesting property is that the system is linear, which means that if it is, we can use the principle of a superposition. Here is one example. If you give this input, we get that output. If you give the input a few seconds later, we see the output being shifted. And now if we combine two inputs, what should we see in the output? Well, we see the superposition of the first two signals added together. And you can only add them if the system is linear. So here is a practical example of that. Consider a, a hammer that it strikes a bell. If we strike the bell at time zero, then you should see the sound produced by the bell, uh, which is the response of that excitation that should maybe 
uh, could be represented by a function like that. The sound decreases over time linearly or exponentially and eventually uh, dies up to zero. If we strike the bell at time zero, then the sound starts at time zero. But if you do that at time one, one second later, then the sound will be produced one second later. But it will then follow this exact same pattern. So what happens now if we strike the bell twice at zero and then later at one second? Well, we should see the superposition of these two sounds. The first one that it will start at time zero and then when the, the, uh, the bell is struck again at one second, we'll see another peak and then that it will decrease over time. So what are we doing here? We are describing the output of the system. We are describing the sound produced by the bell based on strikes, based on primitive functions that will give the fundamental behavior of the, the, the bell when it's provided with a, uh, a given input. So these functions need to be the most primitive functions we can think of. In this example here, I'm applying this uh, excitation to the bell for a small amount of time. If we decrease that small amount of time, we can create uh, and make that, um, uh, that uh, the time, the duration of the hit 10 to zero, then you are starting to create a function that is the most primitive function, most primitive way to uh, strike the bell, right? And in that way, we might be able to describe the entire response of the bell based on these primitive impulses, primitive in, uh, inputs to it. And that's where the impulse response comes in. The impulse function comes in. The impulse function is an attempt to create a function that is the most primitive function, most primitive input, most simple that we can uh, provide to a system. In the case of, a, of a, that a bell, there would be a strike that would technically, uh, in theory, last a very, very small amount of time. So we can think about that as the time the, the hammer is uh, in contact with the bell, we can represent that by this delta t. That's how long we apply that excitation. Of course, we want this to be a very primitive function. So to do that, we need to make this delta t tend to zero, right? Tend to zero. But then this thing becomes a bit complicated because we don't know the magnitude of that, uh, that strike. Uh, so to normalize this, what we can do is to call this height of this function, the uh, intensity of this pulse, something that is inversely proportional to the time that that excitation is applied. So let's make that a magnitude one over T. Now we are starting to get something that is normalized, that is not random anymore, is unique in the sense that the area under this curve here or how much energy is delivered to the hammer in some sense is the integral of that. And the integral is simply the area, which was the height times the base. And this gives us one. Right. When you make this delta t tend to zero, well, the th theoretically, the pulse should tend to infinity when delta t is zero, but for a very, very small non-zero value of delta t, the area under that curve is always one. And that's why it is called the unit impulse. So that is the most primitive mathematical function that it can describe the simplest input we can apply to a system. That's the purpose of this. And now we can define this function as follows. We are applying the excitation at a magnitude one of delta t for t between zero and delta t. Or elsewhere in uh, over time, that excitation goes to zero. Okay. And then again, delta t will tend to zero. So because this is now normalized over delta t, uh, we know that it's a unit step input. The area under the curve is always one. So what it could do just to make things uh, even easier to, to represent is to multiply both sides of the equation here by delta t. And then we can now, now we have the uh, 
function, the impulse function represented by that delta. Uh, and we have the Dirac function and you have the amount of time that a function is applied to. And that equates to one, okay? When delta t tends to zero, then this will, this area will be most, most of the time represented by this arrow. Okay? And here we see something else. Now, if this is the input to the system, we can calculate the output to data that is created by that impulse function. And that's what we call the impulse response. In the case of the hammer, it would be that a sound that decreases over time right, based on the, uh, the ideal uh, way to strike the hammer, the most primitive way, which is a uh, hit that lasts a few, uh, only a small amount of time, and the uh, magnitude would also then correspond to, to, to that, but inversely proportional to the amount of time we, um, we, we uh, strike the hammer. Do you the bell? Okay, so provided now that the system is again linear time invariant, then if we apply this delta function later in the uh, in time, nothing will change. The impulse response remains exactly the same, but it will start, of course, the uh, same amount of time later. So if this is applied at a, then the impulse response it starts at a and then decay. Okay. Any questions here? No? Okay, so now let's assume that instead of just giving the hammer one, the, the, the bell one strike, we are doing that repeatedly over time. And that's the second graph here. Every small delta T, we hit the hammer and you observe the output response of the hammer, uh, of the, the bell sound. We hit the bell and you observe the, the sound generated by it. What are we doing here? We are representing the output, we are representing the sound based on the impulse response of the system because you're now combining many different impulse responses shifted over time. We are basically adding up all the sound produced by the bell. We are adding up all of its impulse responses in a fashion that will now um, be dictated by the impulse, the input, the input function. This input function could be anything else. It could be a ramp like this, which means that over time we hit the hammer, we hit the bell fast, uh, uh, faster and with more intensity uh, that is increasing over time. It doesn't matter because you can simply scale up the output of our system. The sound will be just shifted upwards. Remember the system is linear, so it's a homogeneous system. If we strike the bell twice as hard, we should see twice more sound and then the sound decays to zero. So if we increase the magnitude of the strike, then simply this curve goes up and then it eventually decays. But what are we doing here? We are now formulating a different type of input. How many times we strike the hammer, how intense that strike is. And then we calculate the output based on the linear combination of the impulse response. This, has, this is a very important, uh, it is a very important observation we can make here, which is the fact that we can now describe the response of the system to any input provided that we know the system's response to a impulse excitation, provided that we know the most basic uh, response of the system or the response of the system to the most basic excitation, which is the impulse. Any questions? Is the concept clear? Yeah? Okay. So now remember that the impulse function is only acting in the period of time that we specified, which in this particular case here would be delta t between zero and delta t. It only exists between zero and delta t. And it has a magnitude that is normalized. 
which means that if we use this function properly, we can describe any signal as a combination of time-shifted impulses. Let me repeat that. We can describe any signal as a combination of time-shifted impulses. For example, here we have this signal x of t. It's the blue curve. Is a signal, is a random signal. And we can, you know, for any value of time, we can just sample, uh, do uh, evaluate x of t, plot x of t there. We can take any samples from this signal at any time. But you can describe this signal as uh, a combination of time-shifted impulses. For example, to get this point here, we need to create an impulse of this time of a certain magnitude that corresponds to x of t0, if this is t0. If you take this point here, we need to create an impulse response of that magnitude that corresponds to the magnitude of x at t1, let's call that t1, and so on. We can now take uh, several points along this curve and describe the signal as a sum of all these instantaneous points over time that only last for the duration of delta t. So when you add everybody up, only and you make now delta t um, in, uh, is scan the time uh, axis, we are basically moving on uh, along this collection of impulses. So mathematically, what, how can we represent that? Well, mathematically, we have it here. The very first point here is the impulse that exists at time zero. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the, excuse me, is the value of the function at time zero. Let me, let me put that at zero right there. Is the value of the function at time zero times the impulse function. Can you please mute your microphone if, you're, uh, if you don't have questions. Who has the microphone on? Okay, that's good. All right, so that's the impulse. Uh, for, for now, that value of x0 is only valid for a certain amount of time here that we are uh, determining to be delta t. And the delta t tending to 0 will now make the perfect signal. And that is multiplied by the impulse function because the impulse function is only valid for that uh, we'll only make this happen for that specific amount of time. So that's the very first sample. Now we can move on by delta t and take the second sample, which will occur delta t seconds after, which is right there. What are we doing here? This is the part that corresponds to that. We are evaluating the function at delta t, of course. We are letting that function out to trigger delta t seconds later you see t minus delta t there means that we need to wait delta t until what we get inside of that function is zero and that will trigger the impulse and then of course times the uh width times the uh the normalized version uh, normalized input uh the base of the function as we saw before as we define the inputs the, the impulse response and you multiplied everything by delta t on both sides. So it shows up here to now normalize the magnitude of that input to the unit. If you now move on to the next point, next point here, what do we do? Well, we are sampling now the signal to in the next interval, which is two times delta t now. We are letting the signal exist only at two delta t seconds. And then you're also normalizing the signal by multiplying everything by delta t. So what we see mathematically here is simply a linear combination of a product between the signal itself and the impulse function that will let that signal exist for that small amount of time. Of course, this is an approximation of the signal provided that a delta t is a finite number. We are discretizing the system in some, the signal in some sort. But if delta t tends to zero, we can create a smooth function, a continuous function that will perfectly represent the signal x of t over time. This uh, calculation here can be put into a sum, more uh, simply put like that. 
We are now evaluating the system from negative infinity to plus infinity over time because that's where this, the signal exists. Multiplying the signal itself sampled at a given time, letting it exist for this amount of time and multiplying that by its duration to normalize the unit impulse to be unit. Okay. Any questions here? No questions? No? Anybody? All right. Okay, so what do we do with all this? We are describing systems with a time response, with um, impulse functions. That's very interesting, but what do we do with it? Well, we can use this principle to calculate the outputs of a linear time invariant system for any input now. How is that? Well, the description of, uh, let's uh, go through the slide here. The description of an arbitrary signal. Uh, if you combine the description of an arbitrary signal in terms of the scale, the shifted impulse functions, that's what we just did. We are taking a signal and we are uh, representing that signal as a collection of impulse functions. And we take the impulse function itself, that is, um, uh, we create, we, we use the impulse response of a system, the impulse response of a system or the response of the system to the most primitive form of input. And we combine these two. Now we now let, what are we doing? We are taking the impulse response of the system and we're letting that impulse response exist only in specific times of uh, points over time. And these points over time where we are going to sample the impulse response and for how long we are going to let that exist will now depend on the input to the system. In the case of the hammer, we, if we are doing continuous strikes, we would now be sampling its output response continuously over time and then adding up all the sound generated by each of these strikes together. That's what it represents. We can now take these two properties, the ability to describe a system based on its imp uh, on impulse functions, take the impulse response of any system, sample that at specific points in time that we want, and through that combination, we can now describe the response of any, uh, to any input signal by properly sampling the impulse response at specific points with a specific magnitude that will correspond to the pattern of input, the pattern with which we hit the bell. Okay, so back to the function we had there, we, can, we could see here, for example, the that X could correspond now to the pattern with which we strike the bell and Delta and all this thing could potentially correspond to the impulse response of the system. So what are we doing? Well, we are taking the impulse response at specific points in time that are triggered by the input. We multiply them together and we are adding everything up. We are adding the effect of all the strikes over time, right? And why is this shifted over time? Well, because the when you sample the second strike, the first one has decayed over time and it has decayed by delta t. It has delta t time uh, second has passed before you sample the second strike. So this all the signals, when we add them together, they are shifted in time. The past ones had time to decay a bit. If I'm, uh, I have two strikes on the bell at every second, for example, when I do the second strike, the first strike would have, the, the curve would have decayed because one second has passed since that sound started. So I'm starting with, uh, I'm adding the signal that I, the sound that I just generated plus the sound that has decayed for one second, right? And that, that's why the signals in this, uh, in this sum are delayed over time. That's why we see the time shift inside of the uh, function 
Of course, this is an approximation of a continuous system because we are discretizing the system with delta t. Well, now let's make things interesting and make delta t tend to zero. And if we apply the limit when delta t tends to zero to that function, with some calculus that I'm going to skip, it can be shown that we can convert this into a continuous function by, of course, instead of using a sum, we use a integral over time. That's a continuous function. Delta t tends to zero. X of k delta t becomes x of tau. T is t itself. And this will also become tau. And now the integration occurs over tau. What is tau? Tau is a dummy variable that will disappear after the integration. And we'll see um, in, a, in a bit what the difference here is. But x of t is now the integral of all time-shifted impulse responses of the system. So to know the system's output to any input, it is sufficient to know the response to a unit impulse. And this has tremendous implication in simulation and systems, because that's the principle we are going to use to model and solve for them, even though we may not be explicitly using this, this form of integration in our, in our examples. That is the principle behind uh, what we are going to do, and that's what will allow us to solve the problems the way we will. So moving forward here, so these are the same steps from the, uh, the previous slide. And uh, if now, so we had a generic signal before that we are sampling over time through this convolution. This is, this is the integral that represents the convolution. But now let's assume that uh, the, if the input is x and h of t is the is step, the, uh, sorry, this is not the step response. This is the impulse response. Please correct that, impulse response. Then you can simply use the pattern with which we hit the, the, uh, the bell, the sound produced over time that is shifted over time because we, the sound at this point, at this instant in time, depends on the sound that was generated in the past because you're accumulating everything. And that's the integral, that's the accumulation of sound. And this is now the way we can represent the output of the hammer, the, the, the bell, by simply adding everything up. So that's the definition of the convolution integral we may also see the convolution integral be represented by this fancy sign here that represents the convolution. Uh, we could write x convoluted with h and h with x, and the, we can interchange them, which th this uh, integral would be the same as you're going to see in a bit, uh, as uh, we could write this x of tau, xt minus tau times h of t d, uh, h of tau excuse me h of tau d tau these are the same the same functions okay and when we see this sign here this is the convolution sign okay so this is very interesting there's a lot of fancy math here now let's try to make a bit more sense of this math Let's see if that helps. So uh, let's make an analogy to represent what we see here. And hopefully that will help clarify things. Okay, so the analogy you're going to use is very simple. I have a box of matches and they're going to light up a match at a, some instant in time. And I want to know how much smoke is, is in the air at a given time, point in time. So at time zero, I lit up a match. It will produce some smoke. It will, that smoke will eventually disappear. At time two, I uh, light up another one and so on. So my question is how much smoke is in the air as I keep uh, lighting up matches at a given, with a given pattern. So to do this, we need, that's the next slide that I forgot to uh, go to here. We can add what I'm gonna 
explain there. Uh, I'm going to change things a bit here. You will see uh, just the notation will change slightly. We need two things to describe how much smoke is in the air. What do we need to know? Well, we need to know how much smoke is generated when I lit up one match and how I light up one match and how that smoke uh, evolves over time. So the first function I would need, let me call this function S, capital S of T, the smoke function over time. And this function gives me how much smoke is in the air when I, I light up one match, let's assume that at time zero, we have the most amount of smoke, and then the smoke eventually disappears and I, uh, as time goes to infinity. What is the second function we need now to answer this question? So the first one is how, the, how much smoke is produced by a match, how much, uh, how it evolves over time. What is the second function? What else do we need to know? What else do we need to know? Oh, I need to know the pattern with which I'm going to light up these matches. So we can create a second function. Let me call this function g of t as a function over time. And this function tells me how many uh, matches I'm lighting up, lighting up at a given time. For example, at time zero, I could do one at time one i could do two at time two i could do one again and so on right or if we are just doing one at a time it's simply showing a curve like this at minute one i'm gonna do one at minute two i'm gonna do two at a minute three i'm gonna do three and so on okay so at minute zero let's call this minute zero I'm going to light up one match. So how much smoke is produced at that point? Well, I need to know how many matches are there. That's given by this function. So the amount of smoke at time zero is how many matches I'm uh, lighting up at time zero, which is G of zero times how much smoke this one produces at time zero, which is S of zero, right? Well, as soon as I lit up one match, it goes to zero. If this was sampled, for example, here at one, so it would be one times X zero. If I had two matches at zero, it would be two times S, S zero, of course. Now, what happens at minute one? One minute has passed. And I'm now going to light up, an, light up another one. What is the total amount of smoke in the air? Well, is the smoke produced by this new match that I'm, I'm lighting up, plus the smoke of the previous one that, was, is, that it started one minute ago. So if it was one minute ago, it's now, if you look at the time function here, it had one minute to decay its production of smoke. So I now would have to sample this to, to evaluate how much this one is produced one minute later would be this point, wouldn't it? So the total amount of smoke at time one is, this is I one is the current match that I'm uh, putting up at, which is at G of one. This tells me how many I'm starting times this new match will also follow this curve but we are sampling now the match at zero seconds because i just started it right we're starting one match at and this is the amount of smoke it produces right now because it's time uh, for that specific match just to start it. plus the smoke produced by the one that we just started here one minute ago so that was g of zero because it started uh, it's how many we started at time zero is g of zero. That doesn't change. But now the function of s that it gives how much smoke it is produced it has to be evaluated one second later. Because one second has passed between these two. All right, so this is the effect of the first match one second 
or one minute later. Is this clear? Does this make sense? Does this make sense? Yes, no. Is okay, yes, professor, it's uh, clear. Clear? All right. Very good. All right, so tell me now what is, how much is smoke if I go to time two and I start another match. This is, sorry, this Y. How much smoke do we get there? Tell me the expression for this one. Uh, G of two times S of zero. G of two times S of zero. Very good. What does this represent? That's the how many matches I'm starting at time two plus at this specific time where they just started. Zero seconds has passed since they started. So we are sampling the function at zero. Very good. Plus? Uh, plus G of one times S of one. Plus G of one times S of one. Very good. Plus G of one times s of one what does this one represent g of one s of one well this is the match that it was that it started at one second earlier that's the match at one minute one it's the match that it started at minute one how many we started one second has passed between these two so this is one second later Right? And now we are simply, it's a smoke production one minute later or one second. What else? Well, don't forget this one. So what, what else we have? Plus? G of, G of zero times S of two. Excellent. G of zero times S of two. G of zero plus S of two. The very first match that is started here, now sampled two seconds later. Right, which uh, is then given by the function f of z. Okay? And if you now have another one, you can just add everything up. So what are we doing here? Well, we are adding up a combination of linear uh, time-shifted responses, which are these responses here. We are sampling them over time and adding up their values shifted over time because we are accumulating all the smoke generated by the matches. We can create an expression for this. So another function that I forgot to mention here is this function g. This function g is the input to the system. It's how many matches we are sampling. This is here, looks like a step function, but it could have been anything else. It just gives us how many matches are, are being uh, Lit, uh, light, uh, uh, excuse me, lit up at a given time. And now this one is the impulse response of a given match. So if you want to sample the signal at any time, we could create a sum here to make things a bit fancy. At time i, this expression could be represented as the sum of i equals to zero to two. So if we have here two matches. So i is the number of matches that are spaced by one minute. So technically this is time times G over uh, G times two minus I S of I. And when I is zero, we have G of two times S of zero. When I is one, we have G of one times S of one. And when I is two, we have G of zero S of two which is the same as the sum of i equals to zero to two of s of two minus i you can check this times g of i you can flip it i will create the same expression okay so this is a very interesting approximation of that but this uh, only works for a discrete system because we are assuming that there is one minute between every match, right? But if instead you're looking at a continuous system, for example, this instead of being a 
um, and the number of matches could be a continuous voltage applied to, the, to a system, we can't really discretize that because it is a continuous function. So that's where now the integration from zero to T, G, T minus tau, S of tau would come in. And the, the definition of the, the uh, convolution showing up again, we see here that a tau, uh, that we see T here being shifted over time. That's what we see here. We see the, in, the uh, index I that now serves as time, right? And you have these two functions again, the impulse response over, uh, shifted over time and the function that dictates the input to the system, how many matches we are uh, starting at a given point in time, okay? So this is basically the continuous version of that. A function sam uh, sampled uh, over time that is shifted in time, every time we sample it, and this function is how, how many of these impulses responses are being triggered and when. Okay, so there is uh, something to be aware of if you go to the next slide here as I'm going to erase the, the light board. Actually, before I erase the light board, are there any questions here? Uh, I have a question. Yep. Um, in the integral, what does the K represent? The K? Yeah, like the top value in the integral. Oh, that's supposed to be T. Um, looks like it looks like a k but it's t right because it, 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 here we had i is still like okay that's better no it's like an alpha now uh, we had i here that would be the equivalent of time and the integral when the sum went over all i's right now i becomes t so the integral needs to be done over time t okay any other questions? Uh, yeah, I had a question. So um, the integral that you just wrote down is a bit different from the one on the previous slide. Um, so on the previous slide, you had the integral of x of tau, which is the unit impulse multiplied by h of t minus tau, which is the step response. And here I think they're switched. Um, they, yes, they, they can be switched. They, they are the same. See, the, uh, sorry, it's not the step response, it's the impulse. There was a mistake there. Uh, if you're referring to this slide here, uh, H of T is the impulse, not the step. Okay. That, that's you. my mistake. Yeah. All right. So let's go back here. Uh, you see, we can rewrite this expression the other way. It doesn't matter because you see here, the way you represented this function was through this sum. So we put the G with the time delay and S without it. But if we flip it and you expand this, we'll go back to the same one. We can interchange them. So this expression could be also written the other way, G of tau, S, T minus tau, DT, D tau. And they are, they are exactly the same. Now we can see this from these two sums. They both give the same expression. Okay, does that answer the question? Yeah, that makes yeah. Uh, that makes sense. It okay. could just be switched. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. So hopefully this little analogy here will help uh, help you understand. The concept a bit better it is a, a kind of really abstract and uh it's not an easy one it's really uh, i think one of the hardest topics in this class nothing uh, uh did, no, this class this, this section this lecture is particularly complicated this doesn't mean that the upcoming ones will also be things will get a bit uh, easier some of them are a bit harder but uh, uh this one is a particularly 
tricky one to, to understand the concepts. Right. Now, I could have presented you with the integral only and uh, ask you just to accept that that integral is the convolution and that exists, but that would make little sense. So it's important to understand what we are doing with this integration and what exactly it represents. Right? That's how we should take any engineering concept anyways. All right, so I'm gonna raise the uh, board here before we do some exercises. But here is an important note that you should be aware of in this integration. So we have two variables, we have t, uh, the variable of time, and you have tau, which is this dummy variable that we created in order to assist with these calculations. Now, there is a little bit of a, this, this notation by itself is a bit confusing because t on the left and on the right side of this expression are not the same. t on the left, there is some bug in here, t on the left, is a specific value of time where we are sampling the smoke. For example, if I want to know how much smoke is produced at a time three, I would evaluate y at time three. Well, that's easy. That's the classical way we approach a function depending on time t. But the t on the right side here, it's a bit different. It's a value that spans over all possible uh, real numbers it varies from negative infinity to plus infinity. And this is what represents the accumulation of smoke over time. If you want to know the uh, at time three, we need to also integrate, we need to look at the past value of smoke for, uh, for all of our time up to three seconds. And that's what that T on the right side of the equation represents. So they, they are not the same. They're not the same. The, right, the left side is the sampling time. The right side is all values of t up to the point we are sampling the output. Okay. The last uh, top uh, uh, bullet point here says that all the output at specific time t on the left depends on the input of all times t on the right. So time t on the right is all time period, the, all, the entire time period up to the sampling time. All right, let's do an example. Hopefully this will help a bit. We have here a electrical circuit and this electrical circuit has a known impulse response for example, if we uh, have this circuit is a, a RC circuit and the voltage is turned off, we put this to zero, but there is an initial voltage in the capacitor VC and we let the system start from that point with the initial voltage in the capacitor and no input voltage and see what happened. This would create a current that decays over time to zero. And that would be a good characterization of the impulse response of this system by just letting it go from a initial voltage and watch the current that is produced there decay to zero. And this impulse response is given here. This is H of T. The impulse response of the system is simply an exponential that decays over time. A is a constant. And the question is, provided that we know this impulse response of the system, can we determine the step response? The step response meaning if we apply a voltage to the system and hold that voltage constant, what would be the current developed in the system? For example, uh, if, the, uh, if this is the input. So if you're talking about the response in terms of current, and then of course the impulse response here would represent the current. Okay, so let's define all the, impulse, the, the functions we have. So the first one is the impulse response. And the impulse response, we can plot that. It's simply a function that uh, is, is going to start here at zero and decay 
to infinity. Let, let me multiply this by u of t, just to get rid of everything below below zero because the system is start starting at time zero. So just for consistency, multiply that by step that it, it starts at time zero. And at time zero, we have exponential of zero. That's one. Right? That's how the current decays over time in the circuit. If we just let the circuit go from an initial voltage as time tends to infinity. And now we need to define the input to the system. And the input, we're going to call that H of T. And in the case of a step voltage, we could simply turn the circuit on, apply, let's say, one volt to it, and then let the system uh, did I swap? I think I swapped the H of T should be on the other graph. Sorry, let me just change this over. So this is U, this is the input, and this is the time response. This is H, right? Just to be consistent with the notation, I accidentally flipped them. Okay, so what does this one say? Well, this is a step input. And the step input means we apply a voltage, we hold that voltage constant. What we see here is how the current decays over time. That's the impulse response of the system. How do you now calculate the output of this system given this information only? Well, let's use the convolution integral. We can take these two signals and put this into this integration and then solve for the integral. What do we need to do here? You see that now there is a change of variables. H of t becomes H of tau. U of t is going to become U of t minus tau. We have to multiply these signals and take the integral of them. Okay, so let's, let's do that. So H of t is the um, is the time response is the impulse excuse me is the impulse response of the system. We are just going to change that to tau. So H of t becomes H of tau. Uh, nothing uh, really complicated here. T became tau. Now for the other function for the input function we had u of t and you need to convert that into u of t minus tau so u of t is given here is just an impulse function we can convert this call this u of tau easily i just flip everything here to tau now you notice that a tau here is negative so when we flip the function and now it's now negative tau the function will exist during the negative value of tau only, right? So for any, remember that the impulse function, the step function is defined as anything, when any when this part inside the function is greater than zero, the function exists. And when it's not, then the function does not exist, it's zero. So for any value that's negative, negative times negative one is positive. So the function exists so long as tau is negative. So we flip the function around the uh, time, the um, y axis, and now we need to add t to it. So this t will now shift the function over time. If t is positive, we will shift it to the left. If it's t is negative, we'll shift it. Uh, we'll shift it to the right. If t is negative, we'll shift it, it to the left. So t is added to it. The function works like that. Are we good with this transformation here? Did we cover this in the last lecture? Yeah? No? Any questions here? Is all good? This transformation from U of T to U of T minus tau, this needs to be clear because it's up the, the base. Yeah? Or hearing nothing, I'm going to go on. So what we did, let's, let, let me just recap. We had the impulse function. We changed that to a dummy variable t, tau. And the, impulse, the input function, which is the step u of t, was converted into t minus tau. We flipped that around 
the image, the, uh, the y-axis, and then add a delay to it, and that delay was now t. Okay, so here are the these functions, these two functions, the uh, over tau now. And now we need to look at this integration and see uh, what we are doing, or uh, what to do with this t. Now, if you look at this integral, this number, this t is in there. It hasn't been specified, which means that this t needs to translate over the entire tau axis. It needs to go from negative to positive infinity tau. If we are going to shift this blue curve now from negative infinity to plus infinity by moving t, to, by scanning the entire tau axis. This other function here is fixed. And what you're going to do is to first multiply these two functions and see if there is any overlap between them that is non-zero. If we take the integral of zero, it's going to be zero. So you're only concerned with in overlaps that are not zero. But these overlaps will have to be defined given that t goes from negative infinity to plus infinity. So this curve is shifting from negative infinity to plus infinity, the blue curve is translating on the tau axis. Where does a overlap exist and how many different overlaps can we see? Well, so long as t is, neg is less than zero, is along this part of the axis here is, is zero. So when we do the multiplication, this is zero. So y of t is always zero provided that t is less than zero. Now, if t is less than zero, it's going to be to the right, excuse me, to the left, I always mix this up, to the left here, it's going to be along that, but then it's going to be multiplied by zero from the other function. So if t is zero, the multiplication is zero, the integration over that time, that period up to t equals to zero is zero. There's nothing there for us. However, when t is greater than zero, we see here that now there is an overlap. When t is greater than zero, we are taking this function, we are taking the impulse function, and here we can multiply them. This will result in a non-zero value, and then we can integrate that to calculate the final response of y of t. So, what do we do here? Well, we can look at our integral and the integral is not zero. We can now multi multiply these two values. We will take the integral for this portion, for this interval, which goes from zero to t of h of tau, which has been defined here as exponential of negative a tau, exponential of negative a tau, times the shifted time function here, which has a magnitude of one, within that interval, the function uh, is, uh, value is one. We take the integral over d tau. Any questions here? Sorry, could you just repeat why you're multiplying uh, the exponential by one? Yes. So this exponent. So the exponential is this function here that exists within this range from zero to t, and the ex the one comes from the other function. If you look up to the definition of the integration here, we are multiplying two functions. The, here is the step. Uh, sorry. Here is the the uh, impulse response, and here is the step input which is this function there. And for t is uh, between zero, for, for tau between zero and t, the function is defined as uh, having a value of one. Right? So if this was two, u of t minus tau, then you would have a value of two. Oh, right, okay, right. thank you. So that's that, what that number one comes from, okay? So, what is the result of this integration? 
What is the result of this integration? Negative 1 over a exponential of negative a tau from 0 to t, which gives negative 1 over a exponential of negative a t minus 1, right? Exponential of 0 is, uh, is 1. So this is the same as 1 over a, 1 minus exponential of negative a t. And what is this calculation? Well, this is y of t. y of t. Okay. Let me just uh, uh, see this again a bit. Okay, there we go. Okay, any questions here? All right, so that's the integration uh, we just performed. Actually, could have used this slide instead. Integral from zero of t, uh, to t of that. So one negative one over a exponential of negative a t evaluated from zero to t. This is gonna be one over a one minus exponential of negative a t. And now you can plot the time response. This is it. This is now the result of the input uh, of the output given the provided input. Okay, that's the step response of the system by, con by the convolution of the unit impulse response and the given function that we adopted as the input to the system. So this represents the voltage across the capacitor rather than uh, the current. If, uh, if this was the current, the current in DC would be zero. So that, that clearly doesn't represent the, uh, the current in the system. It represents the voltage across the capacitor. So given the impulse response to the circuit, the time, the ter determine its time response to a unit step input. I forgot to specify what time response. Time response of what? Of the current, of the voltage. We can put a voltage here, VC, and this would be, uh, this information is missing, is basically the voltage across the capacitor, okay. which would then make, make sense when you turn the circuit on, the capacitor reaches the input voltage eventually goes up linearly, uh, exponentially, and then reaches a plateau, which corresponds to the level of the input excitation. We'll see that in lecture four in more detail, how to model this, this, these things. And uh, another one question that we can also ask ourselves is why is this going up this way? Uh, why, why is it an exponential response? This is also something we're going to see later. Okay, any questions about this uh, example? Let's do one more, uh, more complicated one. I wanted to do three exercises today, but I think I'm gonna have time to, for one or two. All right, so last slide here before we do some examples, some properties of the convolution integral. We saw that we can flip the convolution integral uh, if we, we can choose which signal to delay over time and you can alternate them it's the same property um, associative property we can just multiply them that way and distributive property pretty much all the linear operations that we know all right so these also apply to the convolution integral or leave this here for information all right so let's do a few uh, few exercises <clears throat> 
uh, let's start with this one here. Determine the convolution of the two functions below and plot the results. U of t represents a unit step function. So we have two functions. G of t is simply an uh, a step. And we have as well h of t. That is 3 times a step impulse that starts at time 1 and uh, stops at time 3. So let me write them here before I uh, switch. G of t equals to u of t and h of t equals to 3u of t minus 1 minus 3u of t minus 3. should be should be that yeah okay so now let's just start by plotting these two functions and preparing them in the form we want we know that uh we want this to be written in the integral form for uh, the convolution integral which goes from negative infinity to infinity we have to flip one function. It might be easier to just flip that one. We can do u of t minus tau times h of tau d tau. So this function here simply changes variable from t to tau, whereas that function is flipped over uh, flipped uh, a negative tau and then added t to it. We could do this the other way around. It would have no impact on the result. So let's do h of t. h of t is simply an impulse function. We can call that h of tau when the signal here is tau. So that is easy to, to draw. It would just be a function that goes like that and stays at the value of 1 at time goes to infinity. What is g of t? Well, g of t is... Uh, Did I did I invert them? I think I inverted them. G of t. Yeah, so this is actually just on my notation here. Let's call this. This should have been g, and this should this, the everything else is h. Actually, it's easier if I do it here. I'm gonna just flip them, flip them there. g of t just so i'm consistent with my notation g of t g h is going to become a bit a bit messy so this you know what let me just not use the pictures and uh, okay so, all right, so I think there's no solution. This is still supposed to be H. No, okay, okay, I see a mistake I made. Okay, no worries, it's all good. So I, this actually should have been the other one here. I'm just uh, overcomplicating my Thinking process. And then just erase this. And then let's actually just do as, as it is. So this is h of tau. Okay, I see. So h of tau here is just basically this function as a function of tau. So what is that function? It's two step functions, one that starts at time one and another one that starts at time three, but they are subtracted, which means that when we plot them, we shall see something that resembles this, a function that goes from 0 to 1, then goes up, then stays up, up to 3, goes to 0, and goes to infinity. And this magnitude here is 3. This is the function there. Okay, are we good with this function? Yeah? Uh, professor, can you please explain it again? How did you come up with this shape? Yes, so it has, this is from the last lecture, we have 3 times t minus 1. So that would be a function that it starts at 1 second, 
you see for time greater than one second, the, in, the, the uh, inner part here in parentheses becomes positive, so the function is true, right? So the function only exists for t greater than one. Well, the function exists everywhere, but the function is, is, is worth three past one second, because when t is greater than one, this is positive, then the step triggers. When t is smaller than one, then this is negative, and when you have a step with a negative inside here is zero by the definition of the step function. Are we good with that one? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so now we have a second one that is starts at three, which is the same function, but it's now starting at three. And what we are doing is to subtract them. So it's just this function minus that function. You see that at past three, this here will cancel out, hence the thing going back to zero. Okay. Okay, I see. Thank you. All right. So now let's do the uh, other one, which is u of t. And u of t is the one that we chose to flip and add uh, the time shift for the integration. So g of t is simply a step function. It would go like that. And the magnitude is 1. You see it's multiplied by 1 there. g of tau is basically this where t becomes tau, g becomes tau. And if you now flip tau to negative tau, then what happens to the function? Well, the function now only exists is when tau is negative. Just like that. And if you now add t to negative tau, then what we are doing is you're basically shifting the function like that, and the function will stop exists uh, will go to zero after tau okay so here are the two functions that we are going to convolute this function which is that and this function which is this so how are we doing we now need to take these two functions put them together multiply them and take the integral but the integral will be different depending on where this t is placed. And remember that this t, value of t, needs to move all over the tau axis. So now it needs to clearly define these limits of integration and need to cover the tau axis from negative infinity to plus infinity, and then this t will travel there, okay? So that's where this thing gets a bit complicated, is to define the limits of integration. Okay, so here are the two functions again. And what I did here, I just plotted them together. The functions we just created, I just put them on the same graph and now I'm sliding the value of t. This for this that function there, I'm just sliding the value of t. You see that they have different magnitudes. One is three, the other one is one. Okay, let me just erase this. And now we need to define the values of integration. To define the values of integration, we are looking for overlaps between these two functions. For portions along the tau axis where the multiplication of these two functions is non-zero. And where does that exist? Well, we can only define that provided that this value of t is moving, is moved all over the tau axis because we, we didn't specify it, it's just a variable. Right, so one second. So what is the first limit we can see there? Well, we can see that if t is, is put to the left of one, if t is put to the left of one, we are multiplying this function with zero, and thus the integration will always be zero. So if t is smaller than one, then g of t minus tau times h of t is zero. So the integration is also zero, y of t is zero. Yeah? Good? 
Okay. Now let's start moving this this t all over. In if, if t is, is is going to the left here, it's always zero. So there is little for us there. But now we can slide t to the left, to the right. I always mix everything up. To the right, and we can see now that there is an overlap. If you take these two functions here between one and three. We can multiply these two functions together and between one and three and one and t, excuse me, one and t, the overlap exists. And this will be true provided that a t is between one and three. Provided that the t is placed between one and t, there is an overlap here, but the overlap Careful only exists between one and t. And what do we do now? Well, now we apply the integral, which is the integral of the multiplication of these two functions, the multiplication of h of t times the multiplication of g of tau minus t, so this curve times that curve. But this only holds between 0 and t. What is the value of h of t in that interval is 3. What is the value of g in that interval is 1. And this is the tau. Uh, Excuse me, sir. I don't understand why the limits are 0 and t, not 1 and t. Yes, I just realized the mistake I made. This is one. Yeah, I said one. I wrote zero. So between one and t, yeah, the in, the the integral is only non-zero between one and t, and this is the only overlap of the function provided that a t is between one and three. So this is indeed one, right? Not not zero as I accidentally wrote there. What is the result of this integration here? Y of t is, this is just 3 times t, right, from 1 to t. So that is 3 times t minus 1. Okay. Very well. Is there any other interval that we should pay attention on to? We covered from negative infinity to one, no overlap. From one to three, there is an overlap between one and t. Uh -huh, here it is, one and t, overlap and multiplication of the functions. What else should we cover? When t is larger than three. When t is larger than 3, very good. When t is larger than 3, what is happening? There is an overlap. See here, the overlap doesn't exist because it's the function times 0, so there's nothing there. But there is an overlap right here. Right? And this so overlap the, is fixed the, between 1 and 3. Yeah? No, 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 I understand. Yeah? Okay, so what is the integration there? is the integral from one to three. That's the, even though t is, all, uh, is over that is past three. See, when we pass three, this is still exists, right? This overlap is still exists. So you're going from one to three of g, which is one, times h, which is three within that interval. All right, this is the magnitude here is three. The magnitude here is one, right? The height of these things. Basically, what we're doing is just to take the uh, the area there, right? And this is the oh sorry, d tau. This is three nine minus three six. Okay, which is basically the area of this, this box, right? 
All right, so now we have the entire function here. You can go to the one slide later, here's the summary of that. We can now plot the result. The result here is y of t, and y of t is defined in three different ranges. Let me call this t, and this is y of t. What do we see? From t between zero, between negative infinity and one, the function is zero. So we can do between negative infinity and zero and, and one, excuse me, the function is zero. There it is. Between one and three. So this is the first one. This is the second one. There's a third. Between one and three, the function is three times t minus one. So at t equals to one, one minus one, zero times three, zero. So we start at zero. And at time three, the upper end of the limit, we have three minus one is two times three, six. The function goes to six and it ramps up linearly. So this is six. And then past three seconds, the function is six, and it stays at six as time goes to infinity. Okay, and this is now the convolution of these two functions. Simple. Okay, that's the convolution of them, that's the answer.